And today the third Sunday of Lent. Good to be here again back in Denver. And the epistle for this third Sunday of Lent is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5. Brethren, be ye followers of God as most dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and has delivered himself for us, an oblation and a sacrifice to God for an odor of sweetness, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, that it not so much as be named among you, as becometh saints, nor obscenity, nor foolish talking, nor scurrility, which is to no purpose, but rather giving of thanks, for know ye this, and understand, that no fornicator, nor unclean person, nor covetous person, which is serving of idols, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God, that no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things becometh the anger of God upon the children of unbelief. Be ye not therefore partakers with them, for you were heretofore darkness, but now light in the Lord. Walk ye as children of the light, for the fruit of the light and is in all goodness and justice and truth. And the Gospel, sing that according to St. Luke, chapter 11. At that time, Jesus was casting out a devil, and the same was dumb. And when he had cast out the devil, the dumb spoke, and the multitudes were in admiration of it. But some of them said, He casts out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. And others, tempting, asked of him a sign from heaven. But he, seeing their thoughts, said to them, that Every kingdom divided against itself shall be brought to a desolation, and house upon house shall fall. And if Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because you say there that through, though, through Beelzebub I cast out devils. Now if I cast out devils by Beelzebub, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I kept by the finger of God cast out devils, but doubtless the kingdom of God is upon you. When a strong man armed, armed keepeth his court, those things which he possesses are in, his, in peace. But if a stronger than he come upon him and overcome him, he will take away all his armor wherein he trusted and will distribute his spoils. He that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through places without water seeking rest and not finding. He said, I will return into my house whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then he goeth and taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And entering they dwell there, and last day to that man becometh worse than the first. And it came to pass, as he spoke these things, that a certain woman from the crowd, lifting up her voice, said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore thee, and the paps that gave thee suck. But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they who bear the, who hear the word of God and keep it. That's why the words of today's holy God. The Father, the Holy Ghost, Amen. Today, a few considerations on the rules of doubt. What are we supposed to do in the state of doubt? Commentary on the epistle of yesterday. Yesterday is the, <clears throat> was the second a Saturday in the season of Lent. And we had the epistle about Isaac. And Isaac, one particular day, was blind. And his son Esau came to the, him and said, I am your son Esau. He had sent Esau to go hunt in order to bring back some uh, food that would be eaten, and then he would be blessed by Isaac. And Esau came back, and he said, I am your son Esau. But Isaac had doubt. He said, I just sent you away in order to go hunting, and you came back very, very quickly. How is it that you caught game so quickly? Well, the Lord put it quickly in my path, so that I didn't have to go on a long hunt like usual. And Isaac still had some doubt in his blindness. And therefore he said, come forward and let me feel thee. And Esau came forward and he felt his hands and saw that sure enough, they were the rough hands of Esau. For Jacob had very fair hands, was very soft, 
And Esau was rough and had set hair upon his hands. And surely then this must be Esau. And he made a decision. This is my son Esau. But he still wasn't 100% sure. But he made a decision. This is my son Esau. And therefore he blessed him. But before he said the blessing, he said, The hands are indeed the hands of Esau. But the voice is the voice of Jacob. And the scripture tells us, And he was confused. And then he blessed Esau. And after he finished the blessing of Esau, Esau went away, blessed. And the next thing he heard is, I am your son Esau. I have caught game, and I have come back to receive the blessing. And Isaac said, but I just blessed Esau. And he was blessed, he shall be blessed. His blessing shall not be taken from him. And Esau said, but I am Esau. For it was my brother Jacob that deceived you, and he was stole the birthright, and now he has stolen my name, and he has gotten the blessing in front of me. But Isaac said, He who is blessed has been blessed, and his blessing shall not be taken from him. So what are the rules of doubt? We all hear, especially in the last 50 years since Vatican II, that if you're in doubt, you cannot act in doubt. Because the Catholic Church says that if you're in the state of doubt, and you act in the state of doubt, make a decision in the state of doubt, you are in a state of sin. So if it's about a light thing, it's a venial sin. If it's about a serious thing, it's a mortal sin. We cannot act in doubt. The reason why we cannot act in doubt is because we are rational creatures, and God gave us free will. The, re the word in Latin is better for free will. We say free will in English, but in Latin we say liberium arbitrum, which means free judgment. That we make a judgment and we freely judge. The will freely and the mind judges. So that we see that, that we cannot make a free judgment if we don't make a judgment. We have to judge whether something is right or wrong, whether it's good or bad, true or false. Then after we've made that judgment, we can then decide what to do. If we go against that judgment, which is the act of conscience, then we commit a sin. If we follow that judgment, then we act according to virtue, which is to act according to right reason. Now there are very many times in life, in fact thousands and countless of times in life, when we have doubt, but we have to make a judgment. It's 11.37 at night. It's a 15-minute drive to McDonald's, and it's Friday in 13 minutes. Can you make it <laughs> and get your hamburger in time and chew it down before 12 midnight? You make a judgment. Your car can go 100 miles an hour to 35 mile an hour speed zone. You can slam on the brakes in front of the uh, McDonald's, and hopefully you don't get a ticket arrested or shot. <laughs> but you make a judgment. And you do not know if the judgment is right. You might be late. You might make it on time. You know you have doubt. You really want a hamburger and it's 1137 at night, the 15 minute drive, you decide it's impossible. So you don't go. And you made a judgment. Maybe you could have made it. There are thousands and thousands of situations in life where we are in doubt about what to do and what not to do about what is right and what's not right, in serious matters and in light matters. And if we ever act in doubt, it's always a sin. So therefore, what, what do we, what should we do? We must resolve the doubt. And why is it a sin? It's a sin because we act in doubt means we don't care. So you see a man coming through the door, into your house, and he's got a gun, and he's coming into your house, and it could be a thief coming to into the house, a man coming to rob and murder from you, murder you, and it could be your son coming back from a hunting trip. But you have too many sons, and you're not really happy about the one who went on a hunting trip, so you don't really care. And so you unload all of your weaponry through the door. And if you open the door and find out, oh, it was a thief who was coming to murder me. You are not innocent. You are guilty of sin. And if it turns out to be your son, you're also not innocent. You're guilty of sin. Either way, you're guilty of sin because you did not resolve the doubt. You didn't care whether it was your son 
because after all, he's going. He's going to. Uh, he, he, he is. He's there in order to uh, do to, to to cause you trouble, and he's too expensive. He's a problem. You want to get rid of him anyway, and it could be the, the murderer. You're guilty of sin, no matter who it is, because you did not take any steps to resolve the doubt. You did not do anything. So what do we do when there's a state of doubt? What Isaac did. Isaac was blind. It was impossible for him to see whether it was Esau or whether it was Jacob that was speaking to him. But it was a day of blessing. And God wanted him to bless Esau on that day. And he thought it was Esau that wanted to be blessed. That needed to be blessed. And he had determined that he would bless Esau. When he heard the voice say, I am Esau... He said, that voice doesn't sound right. And when he, when he came up to him and he felt his hands, he says, I don't know. His hands are the hands of Esau, but the voice is the voice of Jacob. Well, I have decided that if, these, if the hands are that of Esau, it's more likely Esau. So therefore, I will give him the blessing in the name of Esau. What was the result of Isaac's choice? Isaac's choice caused blessings for all of us. And Isaac made a mistake. He made an error in judgment. If he had known that it was Jacob, he would have not have done the blessing. But God wanted blessing to be done. Therefore, he allowed Isaac to make an error in judgment. Then Isaac then made a decision based on his error in judgment, so that he was not in sin when he made his decision. And the decision was a mistake. But the result of the mistake is our salvation. There are many times when we make a judgment, which may be an error, but that judgment cannot be punished. But if we don't make a judgment, we shall be punished. A famous case in, in the Civil War, when General Jackson went out to go and see the, the Union lines. He came back in the evening and forgot to give the signal that is customarily given that he was coming back. And a Confederate soldier, a member of the same army as General Jackson, saw a man coming towards this camp. And he had to make a decision. He was in doubt. Is this General Jackson returning? Or is this a Union skirmisher trying to check out our, our troops? He made a decision. The signal was not given. It's a Union skirmisher. And he shot. And when he shot, he discovered that he had made an error in judgment. And it was General Jackson, his own general. And he died from the mortal wound. There was no blame upon that soldier. He had acted in doubt. But what did he do? They asked him, did you just shoot without paying attention? No, I made a decision. I, he didn't give the normal signal that he's supposed to give. And he came close at night. And the General Jackson would not normally come back at this particular time or in this particular place. And so I made the decision that it was an enemy and I pulled the trigger. And he pulled the trigger and therefore he is not guilty of any wrong deed. So what is the rule of doubt? We have a situation where there is a doubt. We doubt whether or not we're married. You doubt whether or not someone's a priest. You doubt the took line. Is this man a bishop? Am I a bishop? We doubt the blessed sacrament, whether it's present in the New Novus Ordo Tabernacles. We doubt whether or not we should go to Mass on Sunday in the Novus Ordo Church. We doubt many things. What is the rule of doubt? We doubt whose property this is when someone sells us a horse for a really cheap price. And the man on the top of the horse is sweating. And the horse is a very cheap price. And the neighbor is probably missing a horse. We doubt whether or not it's a real, really his horse or if we're buying stolen property. What do we do? We resolve the doubt. What is the rule of the church? We resolve according to what is most probable what is more probable, and what is probable. Probably, that's not his horse. That's probably not his horse. It most likely is somebody else's horse. So therefore, if I buy the horse, I am guilty of buying stolen property. I find out later that it's his horse. But I'm still guilty of buying stolen property. Because I pro probably, it was most likely not his horse, and I chose to buy the horse anyway, and therefore I'm guilty. The church teaches in the case of doubt, the general rule is, what is probably true can be accepted as true and be morally chosen. 
We don't have to take the most probable situation. But if it's probably true that that's his horse, then it may be someone else's horse. It might be his horse, but probably it's his horse, so I can buy the horse, and I'm not guilty of buying a stolen property if I find out later that it was stolen. But then the church provides easy solutions to some doubts. And this is done in the Code of Canon Law and in Moral Theology. What do you do if there's a doubt about an authority, if there's a doubt about a, about, about a sacrament, particularly the sacrament of baptism, the sacrament of marriage, and the sacrament of holy orders, which are permanent sacraments that change our lives? If there is a doubt concerning someone having these sacraments, then we are obliged to the sacrament, the church, the law says, the church says, the sacrament has the favor of law. You may have heard the term in favor, if you hear the term favor of law. What does favor of law mean? If it is certain that the, that the accused is a murderer, then he must be put to death. But the accused always has the favor of law. Which means, when an, when an accused man comes in, you've been accused of committing the murder in your wife. And I don't think she died by an accident. You've been accused of murdering your wife. The, the, he has, the man who is accused has the favor of law. That means if there is doubt, he must be found innocent. If a man says something, he is, a, he is assumed to be innocent in his speech, and therefore if we, are not, we don't have true, ep, real good evidence that he is guilty in his speech, we commit sin if we think that he lied. Man comes to us and tells us a story, and we don't know if the story is true or false. We must give him the benefit of the doubt. From this comes the expression, give him the benefit of the doubt. Now the law provides the rules of doubt that there are favor of law. First, with regard to the simple case of marriage and baptism and priesthood. A man was baptized. He went in and had the baptism. You walk in front of the priest, you got married. You knelt in front of the priest, you got ordained a priest. Or you got consecrated a bishop. That fact that the event happened. What is the favor of law? The favor of law is the event. So you can say, well, I'm not sure I was baptized. Because I don't think Father really said, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. That he was slurring his words and he might have said something else. I think he might have mispronounced it. I think the water only did, glanced on my head and didn't move. I'm not sure if the water was done close enough to the words. And then I don't know if he had the intention to really baptize me because he seemed very distracted. I have doubts about my baptism. And the church says this baptism cannot be repeated because the, the, the sacrament has the favor of law and that in the case of doubt we must accept the sacrament. And that this, this sacrament is, uh, is, has the favor of law which means that if, if there's doubt about it, it happened. And, it, and, that, and if so, you're a doubt about your marriage... I'm not sure if I'm married. I'm not sure of the right intention. Well, may, I'm not sure if I really wanted to have kids. I'm not sure if we really meant to stay together. If you're not sure, you're married. And you must be accepted as married. That's why there's a court case for the annulment. The church has a court case to determine, is there evidence that says beyond a reasonable doubt that this person really denied children and therefore it's an invalid marriage? or really denied fidelity, and therefore it's an invalid, invalid marriage. Many cases end in doubt. We have evidence that the guy wasn't wanting to be faithful. We have evidence that they didn't want children. But we also have evidence that he didn't deny fidelity, and they had, they had a baby afterwards. So we have evidence that, there is, that they had children. We have evidence that he said at first he didn't want children. We have evidence on both sides. And there is not sufficient evidence to say beyond a reasonable doubt that he really denied children. The church then rules, you cannot receive the declaration of nullity, your marriage is valid. And it cannot be doubted. Many priests have gone to Rome, not billions, but many priests have gone to Rome, and said, I don't think I was validly ordained a priest. I don't believe that I received, the, I didn't know how serious the obligations of priests and I want to be relieved of the obligations, and even may not be a priest. I didn't know. Nobody told me. Did you kneel down? You did. Did you get a hand on your head? You did. You're a priest. And you cannot say, oh, I'm not a priest. I'm not a priest. I'm not a priest. But I have doubt. The, 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 the sacrament has the favor of law. 
Hence it says in Canon 1014 of the Code of Canon Law concerning marriages and, and, and baptisms and priesthood, particularly marriages and priesthood. It says, when there is a doubt concerning the validity of the sacrament or the obligations attached to the sacrament, the sacrament must receive the favor of law. Therefore, we must. The law will assume that that person did know about marriage. He did know about priesthood. It is a valid priesthood. It is a valid marriage, and there cannot be any questioning of it. There must be a court case brought before them to say, "Oh, I didn't really mean there was a marriage. I didn't think there was a marriage. Maybe you don't think there was a marriage because now you've got a new girlfriend. Maybe there's another reason why you believe you don't not married." Maybe you don't want to be a priest because you don't want to. You want you want to move on to a different kind of life. Maybe you maybe you don't believe that you're uh, uh, of the uh, uh, baptized because you don't want to take on the obligations of baptism and you want to leave the faith and say you didn't know any better. The fact is, you are there. The ceremony happened. You're baptized. You're ordained. You're married, and that's the end of it. You must prove that you're not married, that you're not baptized, that you're not a priest. In order to do that, you must show that oh, with that there will be concrete, hard evidence, physical evidence, by witnesses and by events that say, no, he was never ordained a priest. No, he was never uh, baptized. No, they were never married before the priest. It didn't happen. Even though they put it in the register, they paid a man to put it in the register, and the priest never was there. Therefore, there was no marriage in front of a priest, which means it's an invalid marriage. The sacrament receives the favor of law, and the doubt cannot be had. There are also many times in life when we run into situations, is this guy, is this guy the, uh, the owner, is this guy a thief, is this guy a liar? Well, we, if, if, he, if he has possession of something, melios conditio possidentis, and what better is the condition of the one who has possession of the thing, or we say in English, possession is nine-tenths of the law. And then what about the doubt of authority? An authority tells you to do something. For instance, Holy Mother Church says, you must go to Mass on Sunday. But you're not sure if it's a real priest. You're not sure if the new Mass is really bad. You're, you, don't like, you, you, know, you don't yet know that it's intrinsic, that the new Mass is evil. You're not sure that it's bad. But it's Sunday morning, and so you might as well sleep in. You are committing the sin of missing Mass on Sunday. Because the Church obliges you to go to Mass on Sunday. And if you don't know with a moral certitude that it's wrong to go to that Mass, you sin by not going to that Mass. Even though the Mass is wrong. You don't know it's wrong. It's just like if you, if you believe that, that, that that is your son in the door, and you don't know it's a murderer, and you pull the trigger to murder your son, then you discover that it was a guy coming to murder you, so you don't get arrested by the police, you are still guilty of murder. You are guilty of the act of murdering a person that's trying to kill you. You didn't know he was trying to kill you. You got off on a court case, but you should have been hung by the neck until dead, and when you meet God, you will be hung by the neck for all eternity. Unless there was a repentance, true repentance, for that murder. The whole world thinks you defended yourself, but you know you committed an act of murder. So that when there is a, when there is a situation of doubt, which happens all the time, very frequently in life, there's a rule about the doubt. With regard to the, to the, the church says that we must take the, the safer part when it has to do with the sacraments. So what if we see a host lying on the floor and there was and, 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 and in, in a church in front of the tabernacle? Is that a host that came from the sacristy that's not yet consecrated? Or is that a host that somehow came off the altar? It might be a host that came off the altar. Therefore, it is to be treated like a host that comes off the altar. We must take the safer course and even though it may not be, we will treat it as a consecrated host and we'll consume it and purify the place. So in any case, with this regard to the, to the rule of doubt, a common mistake that is made in our times, well, if I have a doubt, I'm not going to do anything. But we forget that we are the free will choice. When I choose to not go to Mass, you are choosing to not fulfill your obligation. When you choose to not do something, you are making a free choice. Therefore, that's a responsible choice for which you shall be judged. And if you discover a doubt, and you do not try to resolve the doubt, then you're guilty of sin. One example right now is the vaccines. There are very many people that do not want to know that the vaccines are filled with, the coronavirus vaccine is filled with aborted fetuses. They don't want to know that it's a poison. 
They don't want to know that it's an evil tool being used by our government to control the world and prepare for the Antichrist. Therefore, when they receive it, they can say, I didn't know. Those who do this are guilty of mortal sin because they must investigate. Now, if they investigate and make the wrong decision, then they are not guilty of sin. But if they investigate and, and discover that the, the, that the truth of the matter, then they, they must stay away from the, the vaccine. But they could investigate and say, really, holy priests and the Catholic Church are saying, I can do this, and so therefore, I'll do it in the state of necessity. And if they do that, after they've done a due investigation, even though they are mistaken and wrong objectively, they will not be guilty of sin. But they had to resolve the doubt. When we say resolve the doubt, it doesn't mean that you are to become objectively certain. It means you must act as certain. So that when you drive to the store to see if it's open, you believe the store is open. You don't know that it's closed. You drive because you're certain that it's open. You discover when you get there that it's closed and the business is closed and you're never going to be able to go into that store ever again. You made a decision to go to the store because you believe that the store was open. And therefore you went. Your decision may be an error in judgment. But there's no immorality in that. But to just go without caring, that is where a sin is. Hence the church says, to not resolve a doubt equals a sin. And the principle of the church is probabilism. That if something is probably right, it is a sufficiently moral reason to do it. We don't have to investigate and investigate and investigate and investigate. There's a time limit to the investigation. If you are standing on the fourth floor of a building and the fire is coming in and you don't know if the fire is going to stop or the fire is going to cause the room to explode and going to kill you, do you jump out of the window or do you stay there and burn? There is a time limit to your making of the decision. You don't just wait and wait and wait. And if you do choose to wait, you made the decision to not jump. You made the decision to not flee. And, you're, and therefore, you, the decision you shall be responsible for. A soldier in a war, makes a decision whether he's going to pull the trigger or not. If he chooses to not pull the trigger, he's responsible for that choice. If he chooses to pull the trigger, he is also responsible for that choice as well. He does not escape responsibility because I didn't pull the trigger. The enemy was charging across the field and attacking us, and you didn't pull the trigger. You're going to be court-martialed. You made a decision to not shoot. Therefore, you shall be hung. We're not going to waste a bullet on you. And so that there is, even when we decide to not do something, that's a decision. So when many souls say, I don't know if he's a valid priest, I don't know if the church is right, if, you know, if I didn't know in 2012 that my superiors were doing wrong and going against the law of God, and I was in doubt concerning Bishop Fillet's turning away from God and, his, and the new direction of the society of Pius X, and if I was in doubt concerning the teaching, as a soldier and as an inferior, I am obliged to follow my superior in doubt. If I am doubtful to what my superior says, he must be accepted. Hence, the, the fake St. Vicantus who claim, I don't say he's not the Pope, I say he's a doubtful Pope. I'm not sure if he's the Pope. Well, if you're not sure that he's the Pope, you're obliged, under pain of mortal sin, to accept him as Pope. You can only morally say that he's not the Pope if you are morally certain, even if you're in error in judgment, but you are morally certain that he's not the Pope. Then you can morally say, I don't believe he's the Pope, therefore I don't accept him as Pope. But if you're in doubt, you're, the doubt favors the authority, doubt favors the one who has the possession of the, of the white cassock, doubt but favors the one who's living in Rome, doubt favors the Pope in multiple ways, doubt favors the one who is accepted by the church, so on multiple levels of doubt, you must accept him as Pope. And only if there is no doubt, no more, and there's moral certitude that he's not the Pope, can you say morally that he is not the Pope. Many souls try to escape responsibility in the decisions of life by saying, I doubt, I doubt, I doubt. I'm not sure which religion is the true religion. Everybody says they're a true religion. It matters what the true religion is. So you had better investigate. You had better check which is the true religion. You always check when they say, is that a good, is one of these hamburgers is really juicy and the best hamburger on earth, the other one's got cyanide in it and it's going to kill you. You do an investigation before you decide which one to eat. Especially if you're forced to eat one or the other. You really investigate before you make the decision to eat one or the other. And so the fact is, if we don't investigate, 
The reason why it's a mortal sin is because we don't investigate things that are unimportant to us, but we do investigate things that are important to us. Now, some things that are important to God and some things that are important to the church are not important to us. And when we decide not to investigate those things, we are guilty of sin and violating the principle of doubt. Now, when Isaac was not sure, he made a decision. And his decision was a mistake. And the mistake that he made caused blessing for Isaac. And the mistake he made caused blessing for Jacob. And the mistake he made caused Esau to even repent later on, several years later, and caused there to be the Messiah in the family that he wanted to be in. And blessings came to the whole world from the mistaken judgment made by a blind Isaac. But if Isaac had decided to make no decision because he did not care, we we'll also say about St. Joseph that St. Joseph was, was disturbed when he found that the Blessed Virgin Mary was the child. He was disturbed because he did not want to break the law of God. If he did not care about the law of God, he would not have been disturbed. And we see this often in the lives of the saints. Disturbed whether they must disobey the superior or not. But then they must investigate and discover what is the right thing to do before God, what does the judgment say, and then follow that judgment. So in any case, a few principles concerning doubt. Isaac followed the right principles. We must also follow the right principles, and we cannot say, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And there's also something called negative doubt. Negative doubt equals no reason for doubt. I just doubt. I'm not sure. I don't know. And when you have negative doubt, which is no reason for doubt, this doubt is always sinful. And this doubt is, it, it is not to be dealt with. If you just doubt that, that uh, the, uh, the, this man is a priest, or doubt, I just doubt he's a priest, I just doubt he is a pope, I just doubt the Catholic religion, I just doubt whether Jesus is the Blessed Sacrament, so I don't care. Why do you doubt? I just doubt. You don't even have a reason to doubt. Therefore, you're just doubting flippantly. And you're doubting without reason, and therefore you are guilty of sin by not caring about those things that are important and not trying to investigate to resolve the doubt. And after an investigation, when you're still not certain, then you must go with whatever is probable. You have a right to go with whatever is probable. However, when it comes to matters of great importance, you must go with, uh, 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 like matters of the sacraments and the faith, you go with what is most probable. And then you must remember the law of the church. If you have doubt about authority, then forget about the probable. You must follow the authority. If you have doubt about the sacrament, you must follow the sacrament. But the church is also very lenient. If someone has doubt, for instance, about baptism, or about holy orders, or about marriage, if you really doubt your marriage, then the priest can say, all right, I will marry you again. I can't marry you again, but if this marrying you again will make you realize you're now validly married, then for the sake of your soul, I'll marry you again, even though you can't get married again to the same person. Or not to someone else. So redo the same marriage to the same person. Or a priest is worried about his ordination because he's scrupulous. I can't ordain you again. But if there's a doubt, if you're worried about it, for the sake of your soul, I can do the ordination again. You're worried about the baptism, even though I know you're validly baptized. But for the sake of your soul, because sacramentus sunt propter homines, then I can do the sacrament again. But strictly speaking, we're not supposed to repeat the sacraments. The church is lenient in, these, in the application of the laws. But when it comes to the judgment of evil, the church is strict. We, not, we, we, must, be, we must not be light in our judgment of evil of our neighbor or the judgment of, of evil about the things of God. In any case, follow the principle of Isaac and uh, there's a little catechism there on the, on the situation of doubt and what are we going to do in the cases of doubt. In any case, we'll close with that. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.